We are live on YouTube. I do apologize everybody for being late. George has just gone to grab a drink. I'd hit the go live button. Bless him. He's, gone to, he's just gone to get some, a drink and he'll be with us. So apologies to everybody because I messed up the time difference by an hour with all the different um, time zones. So just bear with us. He will be here in a second. Just gonna get the chat room up. Hi, Samantha. Hi, Deborah. So I've said hi to John, Brian. Hi, Katie. So I do apologize for being late. It was completely my fault. George is on time, his end. I'm working with so many different time zones right now. It's um, that's so the mistake was mine. It was really more gonna be 5 p.m. my time, not 4 p.m. Hi, Jennifer P. I think you're new to my chat room. Hi, Heather. George is amazing. Like, with it, he's just been to, he's been having a workout. I mean, it's making me feel lazy now. It's cold again in NC. Okay, I'm back. Hi, George. Sorry, I, I'd hit the, um, the the start button as you said you're going to get a drink. So I've just been explaining um, why we were late, and it was completely my fault. So I just want to introduce everybody to Dr. George Simon. He's a clinical psychologist. I want to get this term right. He's an author. Like I have only really read your book in sheep's clothing, but you've written quite a few books. And I believe you got a new book coming out, unless that was an old video I was watching. Right. Uh, uh, I have written four books uh, total so far, but a fifth book is in, in production right now. Uh, in sheep's clothing was my first book. Uh, it's the it's an international bestseller. It's in 22 foreign languages now. It's just going to be published in China too uh, awesome. this next month, um, and it's uh, it's been on the bestseller list, believe it or not, for 22 years. Um, yeah. And uh, then my uh, uh, book, Character Disturbance, is a follow-up book that deals with all of the various disturbed characters. Uh, that you're going to encounter in your life, not just the manipulators that I talk about in In Sheep's Clothing. And then um, my book, The Judas Syndrome, was written for the Christian faith community. Uh, and then my book, How Did We End Up Here?, which is co-authored with Dr. Kathy Armistead, uh, tells the toxic relationship partner, basically, it helps them understand how it all happened, how we got here as a society, mm. and basically how to navigate your way through this crazy, mixed up, character disturbed world of ours, uh, and maybe inoculate yourself to future victimization. Yeah. Uh, and my book coming out, uh, called The Ten Commandments of Character, uh, is also co-authored with, with Dr. Armistead, and it is it is not only uh, a book about the essential life axioms, the, the learning imperatives that we have to master and embrace to turn out decent people, uh, but it's, uh, so it's, it's not only a guide for rearing children, but it's a guide for how to get your life on track if you've reached that point in your life where you realize that the way you've do, been doing things just isn't working and is causing a lot of pain and misery, uh, both to yourself and others. So um, that book, I hope to have that book out by the end of the spring. Awesome. I'll keep an eye out that for. I think I've got the character disturbance one. I just haven't read it. I've got In Sheep's Clothing in paperback, <laughs> Kindle and Audible. So like, I like listening to Audible books at the minute. And when we moved, I'd packed all my books up. So I was like, right, I'm going to get it on Audible. So I highly recommend it to anybody that's listening because it just, I was even like, I will put your link if I haven't already to your YouTube channel and everything. Because I was even listening to some of your videos last night and I was just like, you, you explain things that are easy for the late, you know, for us that aren't psychologists to understand, I find. Mm -hmm. Even though you teach, you know, a lot of teaching to psychologists right. um, and clinicians, I find it's easy to understand for someone that isn't at that level. Um, right. I loved um, the analogy. I'm not sure whether that's a gift or not. Uh, 
when I was in school, I struggled with learning disabilities. So I always had to work to clarify uh, the basic gist of things. And so when I, when I do my workshops, I actually have a lot of lay people attend because I both write and speak in a way that almost anybody can understand. And, that, and I developed that skill actually to deal with my own learning disabilities. <laughs> but it's ironic that when we do that, we often then are helping a lot of other people because when you, there was one I watched where you were explaining the, the cat, the bull, was it a, a pit bull and then the mouse about yes. prejudice. And it's just so easy to understand when you think of it as that analogy. It was just so, I was like, just, yeah, it makes sense um, to me. Now, I do have some questions that I'd put together and a few are from um, already from the some friends and people that watch, but I'm sure there'll be um, other questions. But my first question, ironically, which we're just discussing briefly, that my son and I were discussing were, what, what's the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? Because anybody listening, I'm, I'm fascinated by stuff like that. George, I'll just have to say, I hope you won't mind, is a life path seven. So they know about life path sevens. And I've got two sevens in my chart, numerology wise. Uh -huh. We're the speakers of the truth, the psychologists. So you're in the perfect profession for uh, your life path number. Um, so well, what is I, the you know, as I was mentioning to you, I think some a uh, bit ago, uh, there's a good reason for the confusion that there exists ab about these terms, and that the the good reason is uh, for the confusion is that uh, even clinicians, even professionals misuse these terms and they misuse them a lot. So yeah. they have succeeded in confusing themselves and the public uh, about what they mean. And we also now have some researchers and clinicians using terms like disocial. And we've always had the term antisocial. Mm -hmm. Even that term is misunderstood. So let me see if I can make sense of this. There was a, was a man by the name of Hervé Cleckley uh, who wrote a landmark book uh, way back in the 50s uh, called The Mask of Sanity. It may have been earlier than that. I, I believe it was then. I'm, I'm going to have to check my notes on that. But <laughs> he, uh, he was working in um, institutions for basically the criminally insane. And he came across these individuals who... He, um, he, he called what they had a kind of moral insanity because there seemed to be no rhyme or reason to their heartlessness. Right. He, 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 he noticed their callous and senseless and remorseless use and abuse of others. And I'm quoting now, callous, remorseless, senseless, use and abuse of others. And it made no sense to him. He thought, who in their right mind would be capable of such heartlessness? They must be crazy. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who coined the term psychopath. Okay. He, he saw such heartlessness as a disease of the mind. That's the psycho part of psychopath, a disease of the mind. He thought it was a form of insanity. It's not. Um, psychopaths are not insane. Wow. They're not out of their mind. They know, ex unfortunately, they know exactly what they're doing. And also, unfortunately, there is rhyme and reason to their behavior, even though it's unpalatable to us, there is rhyme or reason to it. Uh, so some clinicians started using the term sociopath right. to focus on the social predatory nature of these folks. In other words, their pathology is a social pathology. They use and abuse people without compunction wantonly. Um, and so because we know that it's not basically 
a disease of the mind. It's not, it's not an insanity. Some people preferred that term. Now, some people confuse the term sociopath with the term antisocial, which is a term that we have. Literally, the word antisocial means against the social order. Anti is against mm -hmm. social, against the social order. These are your common criminals, the, the rule breakers, the, the unscrupulous fighters who don't necessarily have no heart. Right. Okay. Uh, a, a man by the name, a researcher by the name of Stanton Salmonow said, if you want the garden variety, the basic definition between the antisocial personality and the sociopath or psychopath, he says it's the difference between the hot headed rule breaker and the cold hearted predator. Right. And there's a difference. Yeah. There's a difference between a hothead who's just never learned to stop rebelling and is against everything and wants to write his own rules. There's a difference between that kind of character and the heartless predator who just wants to use and abuse you. There's a difference. Uh, so uh, one has a pretty impaired conscience. The other doesn't have any conscience. Um, so, uh, we have confused those terms. Some people use the term antisocial. Somet sometimes they confuse that with asociality. In other words, you're, you're, you're sitting down at the lunch table uh, in a school cafeteria, and you see a friend uh, who is seated by themselves and not joining in, and you say to them, what are you, antisocial? Like, you know, you don't want to socialize. Uh, that's not what the term antisocial has historically meant. Yeah. But people are using a term uh, colloquially that way. And then some people are talking about disociality, which is uh, just basically not respecting the need for social order. Uh, so, you, you know, we, uh, we as professionals have done an excellent job of confusing ourselves and confusing everybody else. Mm -hmm. But I hope that I have just clarified a little bit uh, these terms and, and uh, how they came about. Yeah, because my son and I are having quite, because he's studying criminology and psychological profiling because he wants to go in the police, but he want, he doesn't want to be a Bobby on the beat. He wants to do like the, you know, the undercover stuff and it fascinates me. So he's studying that sort of thing at the moment. He's 19. So um, we're, you know, we're just having a discussion about what the difference is. Um, <clears throat> and the big um, thing that I feel that will appear, will speak to a lot of people and it does me because this is how I found your book although I didn't know um, this is what I was facing was about narcissistic personality disorder um, could you explain about and, and this is a whole probably show in itself where you could talk for hours about narcissistic personality disorder is there a, an easy way to sort of Explain. I mean, I know there's the covert, there's the overt, I believe, um, there's the different types. Um, can you explain that yeah. to everybody that's listening yeah. or that will listen or watch in the future? Because Yeah, well, here, here's another way we've succeeded in confusing ourselves as well as everybody else. These, um, these classifications that we have developed over time for various personality types and personality disorders, um, these classification schemes are relatively arbitrary and artificial. Um, what makes a personality type disordered is also under serious question. Mm -hmm. um, personality is defined as the typical way that a person likes to relate to others and the world at, at large. 
It's a preferred way of coping and relating. Um, and if that preferred way of coping and relating is itself the problem, then we're talking about a personality disturbance or disorder. Uh, character, uh, we use that term generally. This is another term that's confused. Some people use it uh, synonymously with personality. Character is that moral aspect of our personality. So um, you can have a personality disturbance and not necessarily have a character disturbance. You can even have a personality disorder and not have a, a character disorder. And what we're now coming to realize is that all these disturbances exist on a spectrum, much yeah. like we've, we've realized about the developmental disorders and autistic disorders. Uh, there is a spectrum uh, there of both quality and degree in the kinds of personality disturbances that we see. So uh, what we're going to be doing in the next several years, uh, the folks that basically write the books on diagnosis, the ICD-9 or 10 folks and the, I, uh, the uh, uh, DSM uh, committee here in uh, the United States, um, they're looking at classifying a personality disorder period and then highlighting what features contribute to the disorder. In other words, is narcissism present and to what degree? And to what degree does that define the personality disturbance? Is dependency present? To what degree does that define the disturbance? Uh, is social avoidance present? All these different dimensions. So there'll be one classification, either a personality disturbance or a full disorder. Mm -hmm. And then what makes it up? Um, what features make it up? And that will help end, I think, some of the confusion. Because there's surely a lot of confusion about narcissism today and mm -hmm. all the different forms of it. Uh, it has many, many different forms. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of confusion about it. And we're also going to have to change our definition of what constitutes a personality disorder, because the old rule was, if the person's style of relating is so deviant from the norm, or so dysfunctional that it causes them problems coping and it makes others unhappy too, then we might consider it a disorder. Well, the problem is that, is that many of these personality types that we see these days that are every bit a problem uh, are not that deviant from the norm. As a matter of fact, Many folks think that narcissism is pretty much the norm today, just a matter of degree. Yeah. So that, that old definition isn't working anymore. And the other part of the definition that isn't working anymore is we used to say something becomes a disorder when it's dysfunctional. Well, just ask many billionaires like our current president whether narcissism works or not. Yeah. They will tell you they will tell you you're an absolute fool for finding fault with them because they're filthy rich and you're not. Thank yeah. you very much. It seems to work. <laughs> and they've got this and they've got that and they've got people fawning all over them and the, they've got eye candy for spouses. And, you know, yeah. tell me it's not working, <laughs> basically, is their yeah. argument to you. So all of our traditional notions need reworking. And what we're, what we're, we're moving to is a definition of personality and character disorders that basically looks at how does it impair healthy, fulfilling, intimate relationships? What roadblocks does the personality put in the way 
of a healthy, intimate communication between two people. Yeah. That's basically where, where we're going. So, I mean, I know you can't just go around labeling someone has, as having full-blown NPD, as they would say. Um, is there an easy way to, like, um, for us, you know, in the normal day-to-day -to, -day to spot somebody that's probably, again, obviously it's got to be somebody who's... Well, you know, it's really hard, especially on the front end of a, a relationship, you know, and like I said, there are many ma different manifestations of, of narcissism. I, I, I wrote a very popular article on my blog at manipulative-people.com just a, a, a little bit ago about the charming kind of narcissist versus the vulgar type. Mm. Some narcissists actually do care what you think of them because it's to their manipulative advantage to come across as uh, endearing. They, they want you to like them. They have every intention of exploiting that and using a, and abusing you, but they turn on the charm because they want to seduce you. And they can be quite good at it. So they can be quite the prince charming. <laughs> right? Or, or the other way around. You know, there are women, you know, I've, oh. I'm not going to name names, but I've got a family member who I, I, I can't diagnose, but I'm pretty sure is on that spectrum. And boy, right. after 15 months of no contact, they've tried to get, honestly, I'm not going to say it on, that, like, on air, the things that, the, the way they've tried to hook into my son through his um, heartstrings. Uh huh. Anybody would be thinking like, "Oh, that's so that's so lovely," but boy, can I read through it all and think? And even he right. said that doesn't right. wash for me. And he's nineteen. Right. He's like, right. "Yeah." Right, and we should make that point. You know, uh, there uh, we are in an age of equal opportunity, sex-wise, equal equal opportunity, gender-wise with respect to personality and character disturbances. Uh, so, you know, when I, when, when I give the example uh, of a male, their, their female counterparts are, are, are exactly the like, alike. But, you know, you can contrast that charming type with the more vulgar type who just doesn't care what you think and therefore says exactly what they feel like saying without any compunction and yeah. they're crass and they're rude and they don't hesitate to cut you down. Um, and we, 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 are, we seem to be more miffed by that. But that doesn't mean that the charmer and the vulgar uh, type aren't the same user and abuser. And so that's how people can get really seduced on the front end of a relationship. You know, the vulgar ones kind of turn you off. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and, uh, and you... you uh, you may only want to have something to do with them if you have to. Uh, you know, uh, it's just like uh, the, the, these uh, folks in Hollywood who had to deal for years and years with these uh, predators. They didn't say anything because they didn't want their careers to be over. You know, they're only going to be in that person's office when there's a possibility for a big deal, right? Mm. And who's going to throw it away? And that was one of the um, topics that I have brought up is about the whole sexual abuse thing in Hollywood. I mean, I know it's really, and a few of us believe that it's going to really sort of be exposed in this. We're in a global year 11 of spiritual yeah. enlightenment, and we feel this year it's going to be exposed even more and more. Um, and I guess people like that, you we kind of wrongly put them on a pedestal. We don't expect that from people that you're watching in movies, that are singers mm -hmm. in higher places. But in the UK, we now have about 70 odd hunter groups that are catching online sexual predator. The, the, the normal day-to-day -day man, you know, up to, there is no class system, is there, when it comes to sexual abuse? And um, cause I know I noticed you, you've you worked alongside sexual abuse. It, is that correct? What I was reading on right. your blog? Yes, yes. Because it's a huge so, topic close to my heart about sexual abuse. I just, the, the devastation and, and what it does to people is. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. we'll talk about that in a minute because one yeah. of your questions has to do with uh, sexual offenders. But uh, l- let me uh, give you the five minute uh, overview of narcissism and what it's all about and the types of it, the major types of it. Um, you know, we get this term from the Greek myth of the tale of Narcissus, the hunter, and everybody that I know is pretty much familiar with the basic part of the tale, which is Narcissus comes across his reflection in a a clear pool of water in a deep well, and he falls in love with his own uh, reflection. Um, Everybody knows that part of the story, but there's another uh, central character in the story of Narcissus, and that's a nymph by the name of Echo. Yeah. Uh, And she is pursuing Narcissus throughout the entire story. You see, in Greek mythology, there are ordinary heroes and then there are superheroes. And the superheroes always have have the nymphs chasing after them. You know, it's a real badge of honor to think that all the nymphs want you. The central message of the story of Narcissus is not so much that he's in love with himself because he sees his own reflection. The central message in the story of Narcissus has to do with his response to Echo. He is completely unfazed by her being enamored with him. He has no need for her because he has found all that he needs in his himself. Now, that doesn't mean that he might not have use for her, but he doesn't have need of her like most people have need for others. You see? And that's what that's at what the what's at the core of narcissism. And what really traps people at the beginning of a narcissistic abuse relationship is that the victim mistakes interest for care. I'll repeat that. The Mm -hmm. victim mistakes interest for care. I might see something in you that I really, really want. It might edify me. It might help aggrandize me. It might benefit me in some way. I really, really want you. Sometimes being wanted that badly really feels good to the person on the other side, and they confuse it with care. Yeah. And boy, do they find out the hard way if the person who desires them so bad can't care. Yeah. And I've been on the, my, my ex-husband was one of those. I right. found out. Right. Yeah. So. Which led me on to you know, right. finding your work. So. Yeah. so so, we now know that there are two types of narcissism, and the one type has a, has a really bad subtype. But we know, and I, I knew this when I first wrote In Sheep's Clothing, before the research came out that supports it. My clients taught me this. And, I, and I, I, I just knew, you know, I wasn't doing clinical research associated with a university, but I knew that one day that my observation would be validated. We have always thought that there was only one type of narcissist, and that's the kind that we now call the compensatory type or the vulnerable type of narcissist. This is the kind of person who, when younger, felt kind of invisible, unnoticed, uh, never got the affirmation they needed. They are insecure underneath. They have low self-esteem. And all of their braggadocio is compensatory. It's designed to call attention to them and to bolster their spirits and make them feel good about themselves when underneath it all, they really feel like crap. You yeah. see? Uh, and we have always thought that that's the only kind of narcissism there is. And you even heard uh, individuals during the presidential campaign here in the United States, uh, 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 those who were contesting our current president for office, 
making illusions that he was compensating for small, small genital size, small finger size, that he was compensating for all kinds of insecurity, that he had a thin skin, et cetera, et cetera. We now know that it is really um, harmful to assume that all narcissists are of this compensatory or more vulnerable type. There is another kind of narcissism that we now sometimes call grandiose or unprincipled or um, uh, I call it the character disturbed type of narcissism. And this is the, the person who really does think they're all that um, they are not compensating for anything. They're, they're convicted of their greatness uh, and um, their, 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 um, their self-assurance um, seems to be confirmed by their experience. Um, they hold themselves in high esteem, whether there's that much truth to it or not. Um, and um, their lack of caring what other people think about them, they, they don't care what you think. They don't make any attempts to seduce you unless mm -hmm. they want to abuse you. Um, but they, they, they don't really care that much that you don't like them. They don't particularly care what you think because they're already convinced of their greatness and they don't really need you. Um, uh, and there is a more malignant form of that uh, that's rooted in severe empathy deficits. Uh, so uh, we call that severe form malignant narcissism. So grandiose narcissists, the problem with them is that they lack empathy. Uh, either it wasn't nurtured well enough or their brains are wired in such a way where they actually can't have it. They can't experience it or a combination of both. Uh, maybe they're impaired in their ability to have it and it wasn't nurtured as well. It can be a lot of things, but for whatever the case, they lack empathy. And in the most severe cases where there's no empathy and no conscience, we call that malignant narcissism. And that's the core of psychopathy or sociopathy is that malignant narcissism. They can't care. Yeah. No heart. So that's the five minute definition of, of narcissism. The ones just from my experience, and obviously I'm, I know I can't go labeling people, but the people from studying your work, I've spent quite a few years researching, reading, watching videos. I've, I know a lot more now than I did say 15, 20 years ago, but the people, I don't know about the women, it's more a men, and it's not men many, but there's, there's maybe three men that I've almost been stalked by, you know, um, not necessarily um, in relationships, one was a family member. And what I know about them all is they were all sexually abused as children, which mm. I understand is going to cause a lot of damage. And I have, you know, but what was my downfall was my empathy for that person that had been sexually abused. You know, I was making excuses for... Uh, Not you have, you have to be careful there. You have to be careful yeah. there. Because these individuals will report abuse histories. Mm -hmm. And we have historically, as researchers, we have simply taken their word for it. When their core characteristic that drove Cleckley, the original researcher, to think of this pathology as a form of insanity, their core characteristic is they inevitably lie and they lie all the time and they lie even when the truth would do better. It's irrational lying. It's pathological lying. It's lying for the sake of lying that seems totally irrational. And so they tell us these things a lot and we have always believed them. But guess what? A researcher decided to finally test this out. And most of the time, you can't believe them. And wow. many times what they tell you is a history of abuse is actually a history of early sexual exploitation on 
their part. Wow. Okay. You know, where they say the babysitter molested me. And what it actually was is that even at a young age, they were getting sexual with the babysitter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's just made my stomach yeah. flip. Because yeah. Yeah. I, there is one case I think was the truth because now that man's behind bars and all three boys testified, like, I'd be shocked if all three were lying, but in a couple of the other cases, it I don't know if it's true, but one I think is true. But um, like you say, that's made me think, wow. Yeah. Well, sexual perpetration, yeah, no, I, but sexual victimization on their part as a causal factor, in other words, that they turned out the way they did because they were victimized, you gotta be really careful. The number one belief that people have about people who sexually offend is that they were victims themselves. And that's not and, always and, the case. And though. here's the logical, here's the logical skepticism that should should uh, should cause us to challenge that belief because that's what they tell us. Most victims of abuse of all types, most victims are female. Would it not stand to reason that if sexual victimization were causal to you abusing somebody else, and most victims are female, would it not then follow that because being victimized is causal to you abusing somebody else, and you happen to be a member of the majority group, wouldn't that group be the majority of sexual offenders? Yeah. Are they? Are women the majority of sexual offenders? Oh, not offenders, no. No, no. 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 So right off the bat, we should have had some skepticism, but we this, didn't. We're now point, testing it out, though. We're now and, testing it out. And I know a lot of people that come in my chat room, that they're, they're empaths, they're very empathic. And for me, that's that. there's nothing wrong with having empathy, but it can be our biggest like downfall because this is why we've not so much now I've learned boundaries like I might empathize with somebody but I'm not getting drawn in like I used to I can see the red flags going off but I see so many people thinking that their empathy is getting them you know brownie points that oh if I'm this nice lady that this man or these people are going to like me but they're just like falling into it's like they're just falling straight into the trap and I I don't even have to see it in person. I can see it on social media even. Yeah. And I get really frustrated because I want to shake them and say, wake up. Your empathy is going against you. Yeah. This is something that um, a Purdue University study a few years ago <clears throat> validated. Another thing that my clients taught me 25, 26 years ago before I, I wrote my book, my first book, um, I... I, I at that time felt that we would learn that victims, the folks that usually get hooked, would have two characteristics, that they were overly conscientious and that they were overly prone to defer to someone else's judgment or to their will, that they showed too much deference. And the research now conducted by Purdue suggests that actually the two traits are what they call conscientiousness, which I predicted, and agreeableness, which is kind of close to deference. In other words, you, you, you agree too easily. What I said, what, what my point was, well, then you also give in too easily. <laughs> but there's a difference between being agreeable and giving in. And I I'm not actually sure because they, the Purdue researchers didn't really test out, I don't think, adequately this tendency to give in too easy. So I think they would have actually found that if they had tested it. But they, the, the researchers now agree that the two traits that make people vulnerable to narcissistic abuse are conscientiousness. They, they prey on your conscientiousness and agreeableness. They play on your good nature, basically, your, your, your willingness to be agreeable.
So listen, you know, anyone listening now or in the future, really take that on board. So your agreeableness and your conscious anxiousness. And I was one of those, you know, all my reports say, you know, kind hearted, you know, good person, um, you know, I've not got, and I'm not saying, oh, look at me, but I haven't, I did 11 years in the military. I didn't have one bad report. I never had a bad school report. I wasn't like, like I was a middle grade student, but I never had one bad report. I never got in trouble. I've never, got, you know, that doesn't always, you know, it, we're prime targets and I've realized that, but not we're anymore. Prime targets. We're and prime targets. setting boundaries, I found really does, you start to see somebody's character when you set healthy boundaries yeah that's when you start to see for me anyway the 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 character of somebody if they can't respect your boundary where you're saying no this is not acceptable and then they start kicking off or start slandering you or calling you names then you start to see somebody's character yeah uh you know um we talked just a little bit a moment ago about some some of the sexual uh uh uh, offenders of one type or another, and I did want to say something about that because you know I I I, um, I actually headed up our state's program for the assessment and the treatment of the offenders in our our justice system uh, for a number of years, and I assessed over twenty six hundred uh, offenders. Um, here's another way that we are seriously getting ourselves into trouble. When we say the term sexual offender, and when we use the term sexual offenders, just using the term implies that we're describing a type, when in fact, that term is inclusive of a wide spectrum of people who cross sexual boundaries, sexual behavior boundaries. It includes young people uh, in the early stages of learning about sexuality and about dating relationships and whatnot, who are above the, who are uh, not in line with the statutes on the books about age differences. In our country, it can be a, a, a uh, 16 year old male or even a 15 year old male and a 14 year old female mm. who's technically not capable of consent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a sexual offender. Does that person have anything in common whatsoever with a predatory pedophile? No, mm. not even in the slightest. So use it, using even the term sexual offenders and, and, you know, when we, we ask the question, what makes sexual offenders tick? You asked the question uh, here, can they be cured? That assumes that we're talking about one type when there's such a vast, vast spectrum. Yeah, I think the type I meant were the, you know, men or women that abuse, you know, young children, the sex, you know, real sexual, the pedophiles, the sexual predators where they're abusing children of, underage you know preteens i mean that type of you know the, the, the right. full-on pedophile not not a boy and a girl where he was 15 she was 14 and they shouldn't they were underage legally um right. i mean the real pedophile types you know can they be cured right and uh, and let's also make a distinction between the sexual abuse of children which is a horrible thing anyway and pedophilia, because believe it or not, not all child molesters are pedophiles. Right. Some are antisocial personalities who will use and abuse anyone. And children are the most vulnerable. Yeah. Um, deviant sexual interest, the experience of specific sexual arousal, either to children or exclusively to children, is what we call pedophilia. And that interest, if that interest is in the wiring, that interest can't, can, we, 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 we don't have methods 
that are either legal or proven effective um, to modify that interest. Yeah. We, we used to use some methods to try and modify it. Uh, by law, we can't use those methods anymore. <laughs> we used to use, you know, kind of like in a clockwork orange, those kinds of aversive conditioning things where you basically make people experience a whole lot of pain and discomfort uh, by uh, viewing images of, of, of children, et cetera. So you, you basically condition them to get sick at the thought of having sex, sexual contact with a child. Wow. Uh, we, you can't, by law, you can't do that kind of thing anymore. So wow, I didn't know they did those methods. Are you, I'm uh, learning lots. Uh, wow. yeah. Well, we've experimented with all kinds of things, unfortunately, you know. Um, but no, uh, if someone has that interest, and by the way, that interest is not conditioned. You know, you will also hear pedophiles notoriously report that they also were abused. Yeah. And um, I wish I could say that that's the causal factor because that it would make it much more understandable and much more treatable. But in fact, it's not always the case. Uh, sometimes it's just part of an unfortunate wiring. And let me say this also, my experience has taught me this. There's a difference between having urges that you know are not normal and then also having both the guts and the lack of care necessary to pray, yeah. P-R-E-Y. I mean, there are a lot of things I've considered doing in my life. <laughs> but I don't have the heart <laughs> to, do it. Mm. to do them, right? So just because somebody has an inclination doesn't mean that they will necessarily act on it. So frankly, I actually know some pedophiles. I even know some folks who we call ephebophiles. These are folks who are interested, who find attractive the characteristics of young people post pubescent, but not adult. They find those characteristics particularly attractive. I actually know some of those folks Sorry, who don't God. pray. Yeah. In other words, who don't seek out or molest uh, people between the ages of puberty and Whatnot. So just having that orientation doesn't make you a predator. You got to have more to it than that. Yeah. You got to have enough lack of conscience, uh, a willingness to exploit, uh, a willingness to gratify yourself at somebody else's expense, regardless of the damage it might do. So it takes a special kind of disturbed character yeah. to pray. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just thinking, you know, um, the cogs are going around in my brain. Just think it, it. Yeah, there are probably a lot of men, sadly, out there that probably do have an attraction to that pre-bubescent, but they never do anything about it and perhaps never would. But right. there are obviously other type that do act it out without a conscience. And um, it's just something that's very close to my heart, the whole subject, because the damage it does to the victims is just, it, it you know, it's just, um, I don't know where to start. The, the damage it does to them and what I've seen and um, experienced myself is just, it's hard to get your head around why anybody can do it. But like you say, they've just got no conscience, have they? Well, especially in our culture, as we define the norms, you see, Technically, when, when you look at the research, they, and they've done, believe me, they've done arousal research, believe it or not, lots of it. It is not particularly abnormal for men, for example, to become aroused by images of 
uh, women in early stages of development. It's, it's abnormal to find prepubescent children of either or both sexes attractive. That's abnormal. But yeah. it's not particularly abnormal to be attracted to young adolescents, basically. Um, however, we don't act on that in yeah. these, this culture. However, there are cultures right now on this earth where children are being given away in marriage at 11, 12, yeah. 13. Yeah. I know, it makes me go cold. I've had to put my hood in because it just makes my... Yeah. It, yeah. I, it just gives me chills because not in a good way either because they're just too, too young to me. They're just not ready. Right. You know, with grown man, it's just... Right. I, I so feel for those girls. I must have... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a conver that's a conversation we so need to have uh, as a as a race as as the human race, and it is such a delicate conversation because you know within some of these countries uh, and cultures where these things are practiced, uh, there's not only tolerance of the practice, but nobody would consider themselves particularly deviant or heartless by engaging in these. Uh, practices, but I believe the research will show over time that there is damage, that it is way too young, um, that no one is really prepared uh, for that at such a young age, emotionally prepared, psychologically prepared, spiritually prepared, and it does damage. And so the conversation that we need to have as a race is about our cultural differences, mm -hmm. how you have that conversation respectfully and with, with a sincere desire to learn only the truth uh, in a loving way about what or what might not be harming us, how you have that conversation without raising people's defenses and without folks saying that you're basically being anti my culture or my religion or whatever the case may be, how you have that conversation, I don't know, but it's a conversation we need to have, I think. Yeah, because um, it does seem to be like the far, you know, um, I'm not going to be picking, I'm not picking on different states or countries, but it is like, um, I guess, like the Indian culture or like um, Islamic and things like that. But the thing I've found, and I don't know about in America, is they come over to, obviously a lot of them are coming over to the UK now and still thinking that's normal and it's okay. And they're targeting, you know, right. the, the 12 year olds and, and not just all the things you said, it damages them physically, I would say. At 12 years old, your body's not fully developed as a woman. Right. Um, and it's a, it is something close to my heart. And, um, but when they come to our country or your probably country even, they think it's still normal because that's what they've been led to believe is normal. Yes. It is, yeah. a, it's a really, it's a huge subject. Um, but um, so I was just reading a comment, might be too sensitive subject for me, PTSD survivor from a long time of sexual abuse, stepdad and mum. There's quite a few people in the room. And if, if it does, you know, I don't want anybody getting triggered. So, you know, do, and, you know, leave the chat if I don't want anyone getting a PTSD flashback because I know it's a very sensitive subject. Um, did we cover all the areas that you I wanted think, to cover today? I think we did, yeah. I don't know, have you got any time for any quick questions or have you, have you got much longer? Sure, I do. I, I don't think, I think the only thing we didn't really cover was porn addictions or sexual addictions. Oh, yeah, addictions. I asked about porn addiction, didn't I? Yeah. Or addictions yeah. in general. Well, addiction and, in general, but yeah, but I guess, I guess the porn addiction came along with, um, well, it's not just linked to the sexual abuse. This will be my lack of, uh, but it just seems this, I mean, I've got a 19 year old son and um, he was able to get hold because of the internet and like I brought him up most of my life since he was about three and I certainly wouldn't encourage 
porn, you know, porn to to my young son. Um, but a, a few times I did, I caught him out. I found that, you know, he'd not he'd been on the computer when he was to me too young. And I, I know men look at it, but I think to me it's not healthy, and it gives them um, an unhealthy idea of what an, a loving relationship between a man and a woman, or both, you know, if you're same sex relationship. And they seem to think the generation of his generation is like, it's just normal. You're abnormal if you're not watching it a lot. It right. worries me. Well, it's the biggest thing on the internet. You know, there's more of it than anything else. Really? Wow. Yep. Um, and it can be a true addiction. It can be. However, I have major problems with the over pathologizing of sexual behavior problems as addictions. Uh, I think victims uh, of uh, sexually addicted spouses uh, undergo what I call therapy induced trauma many times when their, uh, their uh, spouses are in these expensive 12 step based addiction programs and they're told to view things in the same way as we view chemical dependencies or any other type of addiction. And they're told things like, number one, relapse is inevitable. Live with it. They're told, number two, that, 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 that the addict is too vulnerable to be confronted about certain things at certain times. You know, it's a, and, 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 you know, the victim is hoping the, the reason they're, they're supporting the treatment and the reason they're draining their bank account to afford the treatment for their uh, sexually addicted spouse is that they, they are hoping that they can stop this behavior and, and, and get a better life together. Yeah. So, when they've gone through all this money and then they're told such things where well, you got to expect relapses, they might have to be in three diff three or four different stints of treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Think of the victim and what they've gone through. This is therapy induced trauma on steroids. So one of the big problems I have is the over pathology, uh, over pathologizing of sexual behavior problems, categorizing them too frequently as addictions, even when they're not. I, I have seen genuine ex addictions exist, categorizing them too frequently as that. And this model of treatment is overutilized and it victimizes victims all over again. So I have a major problem with it. Um, but I do think that sexual addictions do exist. I do think porn addictions exist. Uh, it's a sign of our times. And what it's really root to, rooted in, I think we, we, we lose sight of the problem when we're focusing on the behavior itself. The problem is, is that most of us will work, most of us will grow out of the sexual titillation stage and move on to healthy human intimacy if we're emotionally and psychologically and spiritually mature enough to find satisfaction in a truly committed, intimate, loving relationship. When that's there, we, we lose our need for this yeah. baser stuff. So the, re the, the real issue is not so much the addictive behavior or whatever that behavior is. The real issue is what's the impairment here to intimacy? Mm -hmm. what's, going, what's, what's going wrong with regard to the person's emotional development, their character development, their spiritual development, their psychological development? What's arrested here that makes it difficult for them to find fulfillment in a truly caring, intimate relationship? That's, good. That's the big question. Because I have a client, and obviously I'm not going to name her, and nobody on here would know her, and she came to me because her partner had watched the, the porn addiction, and she was going to therapy with him. She was, she was a trooper, in you could say, 
But what the kicker was, then she found out he was giving cocaine to her daughter, who it wasn't his daughter. Yeah. He was giving cocaine to the daughter. She got out then. So yeah. she was thank, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah. But many, many folks, unfortunately, many victims experience much more therapy induced trauma before they finally have enough of it. And some people lose an awful lot of money too. Uh, it's just yeah. sad. But it, it amazed me that I'm glad she got out of that for a daughter, but the fact that she could go and support him through the porn addiction. Yeah. Well, you know, you believe the professionals and what they yeah. say and how they frame the problem. Yep. Well, uh, if you've got people who have questions, I'm happy to. Yeah, answer. so we've got a little bit long. So has anybody got any questions that hasn't that we haven't covered that uh, George can answer for you? And people have been saying, like, this is a big topic and I'm brave to sort of, um, like, handle it or face it. But, you know, it's something I was going to do a whole YouTube channel on, the, but not because I'm an expert, but just from my experiences. I mean, there's a lot of people out there doing it, but eventually I decided not to do it. I'd much prefer to bring someone like you on that knows what you're talking about and help people probably better that way. Um, so have we got any questions? There's a little bit of delay on the chat. Quite a few have been talking between themselves. So 50%, I think, I was surprised that 53% of my followers and uh, watchers are men, interestingly. And 50% of my viewers are in America at the moment. So Samantha's put how to deal with a narcissist personality. <laughs> It de depends on what type. Depends on what type, yeah. Yeah, if it's the vulnerable type who really does care and who uh, who has a conscience uh, and uh, who uh, uh, does inwardly feel insecure, uh, all they really care about is knowing that you affirm them in some way. Uh, you don't have to play the game of adulating them all the time. Uh, but if they basically know that in, in your eyes, even though you can hardly stand their braggadocio sometime, if they just know that you, that you, you can basically deal with who they are and that you have no animosity toward them and you actually like some things about them, uh, that's the best way to get anything you really need from them. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can even um, have some sway with them because it matters to them that you like them and it matters to them that you affirm them. Now, with the other type, uh, there is a three-letter axiom uh, for what you need to do. R U N. <laughs> Run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Run like hell, Susan. Run like hell. Yeah. 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 Um, there are some that you do literally have to run, get away from, and you stay. Yeah. I've been no contact with um, someone, no. which leads on to actually the next question. How can you improve a relationship with a narcissist mother? Well, I, I'm going to just say my little bit honest. I actually went no contact 15 months ago with my mother and I'm not afraid to admit it. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you raise an interesting point here because uh, uh, that, that axiom I just mentioned, sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes it's impractical. You know, you might be in the workplace. Mm. Uh, you might, you, you might be in a family situation where it's impossible to just completely That's get away. Nice. So you have to install some firm boundaries and sometimes that's no contact. Uh, sometimes even that boundary realistically can't be set, you know, especially like in the work workplace. Uh, so you have to be more adamant about other boundaries. In other words, uh, you know, if, if they're talking to you in a c certain way, um, you have to basically be willing to put a stop to it. You know, we can't, we can't have this conversation right now because, you know, this is not the kind of uh, addressing of me that, um, that, that I'm, I'm going to, tolerate basically so we'll come back we'll have another conversation another time but this conversation has to come to an end mm. so, 
and you do it respectfully. You don't do it. Uh, you don't do it uh, maliciously or provocatively. You just basically say, you know, no. <laughs> yeah, just calm, you know, when you you know you can have a conversation with me, adult or, or I don't know how you word it exactly. Yeah. Then we'll talk about it. You know, but I think yeah. part of us when it's our mothers. We're trying to please them. We think that's what you, and if you've been brought up that you do as your mother says, then you've got to, you know, you've got all that programming running where you think, well, I've got to appease them. I've got to, right. you know, I've got to do the right thing. But it got so bad for me. I had to, and I, if someone had said to me 10 years ago that I would do it, I wouldn't have believed them. But you mm. know, George, the, the drama, there's virtually no drama. My son and I just live in an apartment together. There is virtually no drama in our life. The people mm. from the outside try to bring stuff in, but we don't argue. Like it was affecting my relationship with my son. We don't argue. You know, we, we discuss like who's going to do what jobs and things like that because, you know, he's 19. And there's virtually, it is just, it, it's like, I never imagined because I, I, I couldn't foresee how things are going to get better, but I can guarantee anybody that can go no contact or put those boundaries, your life will improve so much. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard if it is your mother or your father or a, an aunt, an uncle or something, but you know, if it was a stranger on the street, would you put up with it? Would you, would you, right. that's what I would say to you. If it was somebody or a friend, a so-called mm -hmm. friend, would you keep them in your life? The answer would be no, if you've got anything, you know. So see if there's any but, other questions. Trish, I have about five more minutes if we okay. have any other questions there. Okay. I think we've probably covered. Um, yeah, she must differentiate yourself from her. I have. That's what Ellen said. Yeah. I think, you know, we've probably covered a lot of bases, a lot of them, because a lot of my, a lot of people in the chat room are in America and they've just been discussing about Hollywood and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think we've probably covered, I've learned a few things there as well. And it just shows you can study this stuff for years and you this, but then you speak to someone like yourself who, you know, this is your profession. That, and this is another thing is that there's a lot of people on YouTube teaching about this that are not professionals right so i'd always say to people be really mindful of who you're watching and, and and learning from um yeah the internet is a wonderful research uh, resource but you have to be very careful and then there are these folks who are self-confessed narcissists uh, uh, uh who uh, want to reveal to you all and uh, uh many many of these uh, folks are are our con artists, basically, um, uh, trying to make a buck and uh, trying to aggrandize themselves and uh, tra trying to victimize you at the same time. So uh, you got to be very careful. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I continue to write. You know, I, there's probably hundreds now of articles on my uh, blog at manipulative-people.com. Uh, I, I link the, 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 uh, drgeorgesimon.com URL to it. Uh, that's D-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-S-I-M-O-N. I link that uh, URL to the manipulative-people.com blog uh, site. Uh, so you can get there either way. And there's just hundreds of free articles basically on, on, on the wide range of topics. And then, and then my four books, which uh, you can get through Amazon or digital downloads. Um, and, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, I, what I think will be my last book on the Ten Commandments of Character. It's a, I, I put more thought into this book than any other, which is why it's been hung up in production so long. <laughs> my co-author is really mad at me because a year ago she said it was ready to go. <laughs> and I, I remember you talking about because I interviewed you on the radio, I think it was a good 18 months ago when we did the radio show, and I think you were talking about the book then. Um, yeah, but I have put the links to your website. I've put a link straight to your books in the description. Um, you've got a YouTube channel. Yes, Dr. George does have a YouTube channel. There's loads yeah. of content. You know, go and listen. He has a radio show that he does that you put on YouTube, don't you? Well, it's like it's like a radio uh, well, show. the radio program's on uci.tv. It's called right. Character Matters. Right. 
character. There's matters. a double entendre there. It talks about matters pertaining to character because character does indeed matter. And uh, that's Sunday evenings uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Central Time U.S. So how that translates to the rest of the world, I don't know. But we we have a substantial uh, worldwide audience uh, on Character Matters. It's I it, I think it's the most listened to program on ucy.tv. Brilliant. Well, yeah, for people keep asking, we've got a YouTube channel and you have, and I have, I'm pretty sure I've put it in the description and if I haven't, I will put it in afterwards and to your books. And I highly recommend you go. Oh, and it. by the way, the podcasts are available too. Uh, ucy.tv on. has, they, they have a YouTube channel and uh, a channel of their own. All, all the, so all the podcasts are available too. But you have them on your YouTube channel as well, don't you? The Character Matters, because that's where uh -huh. I found them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's got loads of free content. I highly recommend. And don't, quickly, one more thing. Someone just says, do you see patient, you know, do you see um, people? Uh, I, you know, I, I have a very small select group of folks that I see just to stay current. But yeah. what I do do is I do Skype or FaceTime or Zoom or any of those platform-based consultations all over the world. I have certain hours set aside in the middle of the week. Okay. Um, and they are not therapy per se. Um, and they're not meant as a substitute for formal assessment or therapy. But what they are is a chance to go into greater depth about the principles that I write about in all my books about how to deal with disturbed characters and how to empower your own life um, and how to put those principles that I write about into practice. So um, I do that on two days of the week. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things I'll be doing later on today. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, my schedule for this year is starting to load up now. I, I took a little bit of a break from it. Um, but I get to meet people from all over. The only, requ the only requirement is that people have to be familiar with my work to engage in one of those consultations. So they either have to have read one or uh, more of the books or been familiar with many of my articles and, and kind of have at least a basic grounding in the principles that I talk about so that we don't waste a lot of time and yeah. money. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, there's lots of people appreciating you in the chat room. And I just want to say thank you so much. It's been such an honor for you to come on and hopefully you'll come oh, on again. I always enjoy uh, talking with you, Tricia. It's yeah. wonderful. And I, I got to say, I'm going to give you a plug right here. Uh, for those of you listening, Tricia did at her at gratis for me, just out of the kindness of her heart, a chart for me years ago. And it has proven so not only so accurate, but so prophetic in many ways. So I got to tell you, she knows what she's doing here. On this. Oh, thank you. And, and I know you mentioned to me that you were doing something to kind of get a handle on our times and where we're likely moving uh, 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 using numerology. And I would sure like to hear more about that um, from you at, at, at some point, because I think that's very interesting. You mean as in the global year we're in? or you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll have to have another chat sometime or uh, you'll have to come on and we'll have another discussion about that. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So thank Anytime. you. So I better let you go because I know you've got things to do. And I, yep. if you knew George's, I'm not going to say it like birth. He's an amazing man because um, I, I feel lazy compared to what you do. I think you've been working out before we spoke. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I'm still in my workout clothes. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. And I, you're amazing. And I'll let you go because I know you've got to go. And I just want to say thank you very much. Well, I much will. love to you, Tricia. You're, you're, you're wonderful. And I'm, I was happy to be on your program. Thank you. And I will share the recording and tag you in it as well. Super. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, George. And I'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.